All right, three, two, one, here we go. Hello and welcome to the Gonzo Experience. I am David Gonzo. I'm about to bring you another great episode of the Gonzo Experience. Every Wednesday morning, folks, put us on your podcast app. Make sure you do, uh, you know, do the whole subscribe thing. We're on all, every podcast app you can imagine. Uh, tell your friends, tell your enemies, tell everybody. We want more downloads. We love, love, love when we spread the Gonzo word because I have great guests. Like the guest I have today, she is a wonderful woman who now lives in Colorado, but uh, but uh, as we're talking on Zoom about a month ago, uh, she sees me pick up a uh, coffee cup that was a uh, uh, it was Spot Coffee, which is in Rochester and Buffalo. And she's like, Spot Coffee, where are you? And I'm like, well, I'm in Rochester, New York. And she's like, I am from Rochester, New York. So total coincidence, although you've been back in five years. Anyway, I, what I'm trying to tell you is that my guest today is Rachel Jenks. Rachel, welcome to the Gonzo Experience. Well, thank you so much, David. It's an honor to be here. I am excited to have you. Are you ready for the experience? I am very ready for this experience. All right. Hold on tight. We're going to get going here. But Rachel, you are on the show. We were we were introduced by who? Mills. Oh, yes. Mills Bender who was on my podcast yeah. a while back. Yes. Thank you, Mills. Mills Appreciate no it. Bills. <laughs> Mills, no bills. Yeah. If anybody Not wants to be confused with goes bills, <laughs> uh, go bills. Yes. Actually. Yeah. She doesn't like the Buffalo bills because she lives in Miami, but uh, that's, uh, her, that, that's her problem. Push the fish. But, <laughs> I like that. See, you would know that you would know that. <laughs> uh, but Rachel, you, um, you know, describe yourself as being different uh, as we all are, but you have like owned it. You know, a lot of people were different. Maybe we don't really acknowledge it or, uh, uh, but you flaunt it. You're like, I'm different, damn it. And uh, I, I'm going to own it. And uh, as your sign says uh, behind you, you're going to rock it like a boss. Uh, you, your, uh, uh, your brand is the brand boss. Uh, and you really focus on one of your phrases is owning your difference. Uh, and, you know, let's face it. A lot of entrepreneurs are, you know, are different. They're just, they're, we're, we're just not cut from the same cloth of, you know, from somebody who is like, wants to live a quote unquote, you know, normal life, right? Uh, most entrepreneurs want to make a difference in the world, want to put their fingerprint on the universe, make a dent in the universe, as Steve Jobs would say, we are different. So let's own it. Let's not fight it, right? Uh, only, I love this saying only dead fish swim with the current. So Ooh. let's fight that current baby, right? Let's <laughs> own that current. Right. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I didn't make it up, but I heard it and I loved it. So I remember, uh, so Rachel, tell us what's going on. Tell us about your journey. How did this, how did this all start for you to where you are today and how are you helping people? Sure. Well, it all started in Rochester, New York. All right. <laughs> Go Rochester. So, <laughs> you know it. <laughs> so I have never fit in, David, in any social circle in my entire life. Those of you who can't see me right now and still on camera, you can't really tell, but I am five foot tall when the sun is shining. <laughs> I have never looked my age. I was the ballerina who walked funny. I was the nerd who actually loved learning and loved school. I would rather be outside than at the mall. I'd rather have my nose in a book than in front of a video game. Like I just, there has been through every season of my life, something about me that has been different. I've never fit in. And, you know, growing up, there was a lot of pain and rejection and even bullying associated with that. And so, you know, when we have those kind of experiences, it can put a negative slant or spin on something in our lives. And so for a good portion of my life, I didn't own my difference. I hated it. And I hated it because of the pain and the rejection and everything associated with it. So right out of uh, high school, again, my career trajectory, let me say that again, my career trajectory Very is nice. different in and of itself. And I need to share that because that will explain more of this journey that I've been on of owning my difference, right? So my two childhood dreams were to be a mom and to be a professional ballet dancer. Now in there, there was also like fighter pilot and mm -hmm. horse trainer for the Lipizzaner stallions and dolphin trainer at SeaWorld. But those were the two that stuck the entire childhood. And so right out of high school, I went to a summer intensive that I thought was kind of like my last hurrah before I have to go out to school and figure out what I want to do with my life and get a real job. 
Well, three days into it, the executive director and artistic director came to me and said, hey, Rachel, we know you weren't planning on this, but if you'd like to, we'd love to have you stay and join the company. And so at 17, I got to live out my childhood dream of becoming a professional ballet dancer. And what's so interesting to me now, David, is that I thought that was the ultimate. But if you look at ballet, it's about saying, right? You, the like the ultimate, I don't know how familiar you are with ballet. So let me just clarify this for Not anybody a time. listening. Okay. So the ultimate goal for most people in professional ballet is to be, you know, with the New York City Ballet or whoever, but you're probably going to be a member of the core. Well, the core de ballet literally means body of ballet. You're supposed to look like one body. Everybody's supposed to look the same. Well, I'm never going to look the same. And I even had a ballet instructor tell me, Rachel, you're so good, but you're too short and you have a sway back. You'll never make it. You have a what back? A sway back. I have a curve in my back. Oh, you do? Okay. So I don't look like other people, right? And so he was like, because of those things, you'll never make it. Why? Because I wouldn't look the same. Mm -hmm. To which I said, watch me. So anyway, (laughs) (laughs) so now at 17, I get to live out my childhood dream, which was amazing until it wasn't. And a little ways into my journey, my body simply couldn't handle it. I was dancing 10 hours a day, six days a week did have an eating disorder at the time as well. And so that's just not a great combination and it started to fall apart. And so now I'm watching my childhood dream fall apart and okay, now what do I do with my life? And you know, there was a long time that, and and so for a while being a ballet dancer while all my friends were at college, that was different, that was fun, that was cool, that was exciting. And then it fell apart. And now I'm not living the dream I'm a husband, you know? And so I'm actually really grateful now, though, looking back, because what I thought was a failure, what I thought was losing a dream, was actually freeing me to be able to step into who I am. And I just want to encourage anybody listening who feels like, oh, my goodness, I had this dream and it fell apart or life didn't go the way that I thought. Sometimes these plot twists that are so deeply painful that can feel like losing who we are, are actually guiding us into being who we are that we didn't even know that we were and and opening opportunities for us that we couldn't see. And so the reason that I share all of that, because that is what launched me into the world of entrepreneurship. So after that, I connected with a lady who was friends with the studio, who out of her home had a book packing company, scheduled itinerant authors, had an 18 month old and needed help with all of that. So I went from dancing 10 hours a day, six days a week, to changing diapers and answering the phone and packing books and doing whatever she needed. And then one of those authors took off like wildfire and he needed somebody to go on the road and do PR. So that became me. And then we formed a partnership and took on more clients. And for about five years of my life, I just lived with a suitcase packed because you never knew at any given moment when the phone was going to ring saying your flight leaves in an hour. So all of this, you know, I'm getting on the job training. I don't have a normal background. I'm flying all over the place when my friends were not, again, different, right? Like I said, there's been different in every season of my life. So then I did that until 2005. That was in Jacksonville, Florida. And then I felt like it was time to move back to Rochester, which to be transparent, I'm much more fond of sun than snow. (laughs) And so (laughs) I was not super jazzed about this idea of moving back. If if you're going to be in Rochester, you you have to love the thrust of all four seasons. I see. (laughs) You do, especially the one that lasts most of the year. (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. (laughs) Which I kind of call like slush season. Right. But anyway, uh, no, no shade to Rochester. No shade. (laughs) No pun intended. So uh, then I moved back to Rochester and I didn't really know what I was going to do. And I connected with a businessman who's best friends with my parents to this day. And he really became like my business dad. He took me under his wing and I started a consulting business, you know, because now I'm 25 years old. What do I want to be when I grow up? And I have all this experience, but no degree, which used to matter way more back then than it does now. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I launched a consulting consulting business, worked with him and he had a number of things and as well as some other local clients, but under his umbrella, he had a number of various businesses and nonprofits and under his nonprofit, 
uh, involvement was he was the president of the U.S. board of an organization based in Cambodia that rehabilitated women and children who'd been trafficked mm. and took them from the point of rescue through counseling, education, health care, vocational training. And then they had the opportunity to be employed in one of three different entrepreneurial ventures they had it was the most holistic program I'd ever seen. It was incredible. And so the more that I learned about it, the more passionate I became the board ended up asking me to become the director of public awareness. And so now all of a sudden I'm going to the UN, I'm going to private receptions at the state department. I'm networking for them at a very high level, doing international public relations, again, learning it all as they go on the fly. Right. And once again, I'm different. So I did that for two years and then 2007, 2008 hit. And I came back from a trip to Cambodia. I'd actually been on the road at that point for about a month and a half in that particular trip for various places, including Cambodia at the end and MC to benefit concert. When I got off the plane, the very next day, this businessman who was like my business dad and his business partner brought me in their office and with tears in their eyes said, we are so sorry. We have to let you go. We love the work that you're doing, but we've had to let engineers go. We're losing contracts. We don't have the funds to put behind what you're doing anymore. And that was pretty devastating. So now I'm 27 years old and I'm no longer saving the world. So what do I want to be when I grow up? So I had to eat. So I connected with a production company. I said, okay, I'm going to be creative. This is what I'm going to do. I thought I was going to be a writer. Well, again, I didn't have a piece of paper. So meanwhile, I've been doing international and national public relations at a very high level, but I had no degree. And so back then nobody would talk to you without a piece of paper. And so I had a very hard time getting a job. And so I connected with this temp agency. I said, I only want something in the creative field. And they gave me this lead as a temp receptionist at a production company. And I was very angry <laughs> and said, this is not, I'm not a receptionist. What mm. are you doing? And they said, well, we <clears throat> get that. But our receptionist is on vacation. Can you start there? And so I was like, all right, fine. And so I go from saving the world, fighting human trafficking to sorting mail. Mm. And David, I couldn't do it. There was no purpose in it for me. And I was like, peace out, y'all. <laughs> like you get two weeks and I am done. Mm -hmm. And on the third day, they gave me the job of organizing their bios on the server, which I'm pretty sure is a form of punishment in some company or in some <laughs> country and company. Like what uh, am I supposed to do with eight hours of my life? Right. So I decide, well, I've got to do something today. I might as well read them. So as I read them, I start seeing that they've done special effects for Hollywood. They've won national awards. They've consulted presidents. And they produce some of the largest sales and association and marketing events in the world. And that's when I realized maybe I'm walking away for a golden opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. So I decide that I'm going to stay. <clears throat> And so they give me this job of sprucing up this PowerPoint. And again, at this point, I'm very familiar with PowerPoint, but I had never had access to Photoshop. So as a temp receptionist, I stayed playing in Photoshop until nine o'clock at night. Who does that? Right. Rachel Jenks, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> but I did. And I set off this presentation having no clue that it was a major sales presentation that the president and vice president of the company were giving to a very large client the next day and had no backup plan, which I was really glad I didn't know. Mm -hmm. it went amazingly well they got the client they came in and thanked me next thing i knew the media director was in my office shout out to deb stetzel at fusion productions in webster new york best boss i ever had who gave me permission to try and permission to fail and she came into my office and she said hey you really have an eye for this don't you do you want another project I said sure and so for about six years that would be our process she would come in with some harebrained project I would say, I got you. And she would leave and I'd get on Google. I'd get on lynda.com. I'd get on Adobe TV and figure it out. So I taught myself video, 3D animation, illustration, graphic design, content writing, audio editing, stage design, e-learning, you name it. If Fusion Productions did it, I taught myself. And so I'm so incredibly grateful because I got to learn so much. But if that wasn't enough, I also thought it would be a great idea at the same time to get the piece of paper. So now I'm working 60 to 80 hours a week at the production company and going back to school online for my degree. Didn't sleep for like three years, but mm. got it done. The end of that, um, I had at the time fallen in love with a news anchor in Binghamton of all places. And so I ended up moving to Binghamton 
got a job there as a designer at an ad agency, which is what I really thought I wanted to do. Again, sometimes I feel like we get tastes of things we think we want to really discover we don't actually want that. So it was the worst job that I ever had to be fully transparent. I lovingly refer to that season of my life as the mafia because I'm not entirely unsure that's not who I worked for. <laughs> but I learned advertising, right? And I met all of the local media and I learned so many things. And then through dating that news anchor who that relationship didn't go the way that I thought it was going to, I learned organically what makes a good news story, what they'll cover, what the best time to hold press conferences are, what makes a good press release, all that stuff. Just organically met the local news director, met lots of the local news media. Well, then after that, that relationship ended and about a year and a half later, uh, one of my friends worked in admissions at a local college and she was like, please, we need a marketing director. And I was like, uh, uh, no way, no how. Mm -hmm. I thought marketing was like data and mm -hmm. research and things that just are not my cup of tea. But she would not let it go. So finally, I went to the interview to get her off my back and walked right into, at the time, the dream job that I didn't know that I wanted. Um, got hired on the spot and all of this diverse background that I just told you about came together in an amazing package, not perfect, but no job is right. But this amazing package where I got to use all of these skills and all of these diverse experiences and work with an incredible team of interns that I still consider friends. And so that was amazing. And then in 2016, I started feeling the push to step out on my own. But I had written a script of what this was gonna look like and this did not fit my script, right? So when I first had the idea to start my own business in 2010, I was actually engaged at the time. And for me, what it was going to allow me to do is be present and be home with my children and also have a side hustle where I could, you know, have a creative outlet and support my family and all of that. Well, fast forward to 2016, uh, there was no one in my life. I had no children like this did not fit the script. And so I didn't take that nudge very seriously. Well, fast forward to May of that year. Right after graduation, which is the single busiest time and most stressful time of year for a college marketing director, the board decided to make budget cuts and eliminated the entire marketing department. Oh, jeez. So in the course of one afternoon, I had no job, no computer, because the computer I was using belonged to the college, like no nothing, no, no clients in the wings, no whatever. And I knew it was time to launch. And so scared out of my mind, I launched six and a half years ago. So launched the business, totally scared, learning all the things, right? So fast forward to 2018, it was the morning of my 30th birthday. And I woke up to the voice of shame screaming in my head, another year older. And what do you have to show for it? What do you even have to show for your life? And meanwhile, David, all of these people from my community would ask me to coffee and, and lunch and say, hey, we just want to hear your story. You're so inspiring. And I would go home and think, what's so inspiring about me? And I didn't realize that the same thing that made me inspiring to them was the thing that made me shameful to myself. And it all has to do with this word different. Because again, at 38 years old, I didn't know any single women building businesses. I didn't see any of that around me. So again, I'm different. And so all of these parts of my story that I've shared where I've been different, the reason that I've shared it in as much detail is that so much of my life has been different. And when there's that stigma that different is bad, you look back on that and you see shame and you see rejection. So that all kind of came to a head the morning of my 38th birthday. And then that afternoon, I had a powerful conversation I'll never forget with my business mentor. And I asked him, I said, Dan, do you ever question the impact that your life is really having? And he stopped and he was like, hold on. Mm. Like, you and I both know that whatever you're measuring yourself against right now isn't actually the measure of truly what matters to you. He was like, I think you need to go like, honestly, like sit with God, sit with your journal and just do some work on this. And I would encourage you to, you know, to have that conversation. Well, that launched like this deep nine month journey of me going back to these seasons of my life where I had been different and where there was pain and rejection associated with it. And then when I stepped into the world of entrepreneurship, 
now different meant adventure and camaraderie and all of these things, right? Creativity, innovation, like entrepreneurs, we thrive on being different. That's part of what makes us who we are. We were never made to fit a mold. And a lot of us with the solutions that we carry don't fit molds. So we were never supposed to be like everybody else, just like I was never supposed to be part of the court of ballet looking like everybody else or any of the other things. And so going back to those seasons of my life and seeing how different was actually a gift because I was never made to fit in. I was born to stand out and so were you. And so this journey of owning my difference, because it's one thing to just say I'm different or I'm different, you know, and it's an entirely th other thing. It's an entirely different thing entirely to, that was a mouthful. It's an entirely different thing to own your difference. That's what I'm trying to say. Entirely. It's an entirely <laughs> different thing to own your difference. And so to come from this place of like, oh, well, I'm different and I've always been different to owning my difference. I am proud to be small. I am proud to be different. You know, all of these things. And that's so, so no pun intended, different. Because when we have the courage to own our difference and be who we are and not try to look like everybody else, we give other people permission to be who they are as well. And you know, what I do is marketing, right? And so when it comes to marketing, there's so much of what I like to call the chameleon crisis. What's your competition doing? Keeping up with this, looking like this, doing the same things as everybody else. Well, let me tell you, that's a great way for a chameleon not to get eaten by prey. It is a terrible way to be noticed as a business. And so when you have the courage to own your difference and not try to be like other people or not try to be like who you think you should be, but show up authentically as who you are. First of all, the people who need you then will see you and find you. And secondly, you give other people permission to be themselves. There's literally brain science that proves this as well. I... Love it. I know that you have a mic there and I think you should drop it. That was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, <laughs> I, um, you know, I love everything that you said. And some of the, some of the notes that I was taking when you were talking is that, uh, you know, there were, I, I like how you called them seasons. And it seems like before every season, there was a struggle. There was a point in your life where there was, you know, anxiety, confusion, fear, maybe sadness, depression, you know, uh, but then that launched a new season of your life, right? So it, it's every, every struggle that you've had has been like a different stepping stone yeah. uh, to, to bring your life to a new and different level. Um, and you haven't given in to say, oh, okay, I'm going to just be like everybody else. Right. And, uh, uh, and I love that. I, you know, you're going to like this. I think I tell, I tell my kids all the time and they, you know, you, you know, that it sinks in with your kids when they roll your eyes, when they roll their eyes at you. Right. <laughs> I've been, I've been so telling true. you, oh my God, I like, guess dad, I know. But I've been telling my kids since they were very little, and I even printed it out and, and taped it on their bathroom walls so that they'll see it when they're on the potty. Uh, it says, start to worry when you're acting like everybody else. Ooh. And I just, I want that ingrained. I want that ingrained in their mind. Uh, and I want them to catch themselves when they're starting starting to just you know, go with that current of what everyone else is doing, you know? And, uh, uh and so, um, so I, I think it's super, super fantastic that, you know, you're different and instead of being upset about it, you are embracing every centimeter of your five footness and loving you know it. it. You know it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, you, I, I, you made me think of like myself growing up. Right. And I, I'll have to share a picture with you of like, what I looked like uh, when I was growing up. And the best way to picture it is think of Screech, you know, Screech, right? Oh yeah, I know Screech. Dead, <laughs> dead ringer, dead <laughs> ringer. Except I, except I think my nose was bigger than his. So. <laughs> that is fantastic. Uh, so I realized, and I grew up in, well, you know, the town of Pittsburgh here in Rochester. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, a very, you know, nice suburban town. And, uh, you know, a lot of the guys, you know, have that, you know, that typical, uh, you know, blonde hair, blue eyed look. 
uh, and and you know I look like the Sicilian screech, and uh, <laughs> which you know I, I wasn't always happy about that, but what it did is it made me stand out because mm-hmm. in order for me to quote unquote like fit into some extent and actually have friends in a social life is I had to be, I had to embrace my differences right? and I, and I had to be different, right. I had to be different. Um, and I think that's where my, uh, we'll say gregarious personality came from. Like I, I needed to, like, I needed to stand out cause I was so different, you know, and, uh, and my humor, you know, I was voted class clown. I was voted friendliest. Right. And, uh, uh, so, so, uh, and, and, you know, you're right. Sometimes you fight it. You're like, oh, why can't I just have blonde hair and blue eyes? You know, like whatever. And, uh, and now looking back, I'm like, you know what? I'm glad I look like Screech because I, it, it, it molded who I am today. And uh, at this point today, uh, I look like, you know, today I look like an aged screech. So, although unfortunately Dustin Diamond has passed away. So I, I thank God every day that I'm still here. So <laughs> you don't look like an aged screech. <laughs> oh, you're sweet. You're sweet. I look like my mom thinks I look like a young Sylvester Stallone. So I'll go with that. There right? you so, go. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go with that. Uh, so, so, you know, with, with, with what you have inside of you embracing your journey, uh, how are you, you know, like, how are you helping people with your experiences? Uh, you know, do you, do you, do you work with people to help them own their difference? That is exactly what I do. And I do that specifically in the field of marketing. So I have been in marketing for 23 years. I've had my own business now for six and a half. And to be fully transparent for the first four years, I didn't even market my own business. <laughs> which is pretty ironic, right? I'm marketing everybody else's, but not my own. Mm. And I was like, oh, well, I just, I get business from referrals and I'll let my work speak for myself and everything I posted was portfolio and whatever. And then I realized that I needed to be the face of the business, right? So in 2019, I started a podcast called The Brand Boss Show. And it was all about empowering you to rock your brand like a boss because I hate the prevailing attitude in a lot, not all, but of marketing and advertising where the agency comes in and we know what we're doing, but the business owner is stupid. It's not true. At the end of the day, nobody knows the business better than the business owner. It's your business. And so I hated seeing business owners manipulated into throwing money at every tactic that came down the road, every trend, everything somebody else said they had to do, whether or not it was right for their company. And so back then, the name of my business wasn't even the Brand Boss Show or anything to do with that. But it was all about, like this show was all about empowering business owners to be the boss of their brands. So that's where this came from. So I started the Brand Boss Show. And to my complete surprise, people started calling me the Brand Boss when it took off. And at first I was like, no, don't make this about me. This isn't about me. This is about you. This is about empowering you to rock your brand like a boss. Mm -hmm. And then in January of 2020, I realized it was time to own my identity as the brand boss and then started working on what I thought was a rebrand. We were going to roll out in April. Ha ha ha. Ended up launching a brand new business in the middle of the pandemic, like so many of us did. But from being in this place of like, I don't need it to be all about me to realizing, wait, you need it to be all about me. I need to be showing up. Apologies for the lawns people outside right now. If you could don't even hear them. Don't even. Okay, hear good. You need me to show up as the brand boss, so that I can help you take your place. And so, from the point of like, I don't need my voice recorded. I don't need my face on the internet. I hated selfies, like all that stuff. I don't need it to be about me. Just let the business speak for itself. To this place of owning my identity. And then amplifying that, right? So that I'm not a best kept secret anymore. So the people who need me can find me. And then how do I multiply that? So identify, amplify, multiply. That's my I am framework. How do I see more results from less effort? Because I'm a big believer in working from rest. So how do I do this so that I'm not trying to spin all the plates and do all the things, but I'm having the most impact. So that journey that I've been on for three years is now what I help business owners do is become the face of their brand, get very clear on the authentic identity of their personal brand, and then not be a best kept secret anymore, but amplify the message of who they are 
so that the people who need them can find them and then multiply it. How can they see more results from less effort? So I do that through personal branding, coaching and consulting. And then we also have full done for you services through the studio. That is super, super fantastic. Now, if people want to learn more about you, where do they go? How do they get in touch? Uh, I assume that you will be happy to to talk to somebody interested in doing business with you, a little free consultation type of thing. So give us a scoop. Yeah, absolutely. So best places to connect with me, LinkedIn. So LinkedIn forward slash in forward slash the brand boss. You can also find me on Instagram at the brand boss show. You can find the Brand Boss Show podcast on every podcast app. You can also connect with me uh, through my website, which is brandbossstudio.com. But the two that I'm most active on are LinkedIn and Instagram. And then, oh, I'm also on TikTok at the Brand Boss Show. And then as far as setting up a discovery consultation, more than happy to even just have a conversation with you and see. And I'm very big about adding value, right? So even if I can't help you, I'm more than happy to have that conversation and just give you some input and then direct you to somebody who might be a better fit. Uh, and that is callenlee.com forward slash the brand boss forward slash discovery. Or they can email me directly, david at davidmamano.com. And I will, I will uh, personally connect you with Perfect. the brand boss. I love it. So Rachel, before we go, I always love to leave our Gonzo family with like a takeaway, a nugget, because you said great, great things, but I want them to say like, well, actually I could implement this today. So give us, give us a little bit of your secret sauce. What can someone do, an entrepreneur uh, building their business do today to own their difference and be the boss of their brand? Be who you are. And I know that sounds simple, but it's easier to say than to do. And so many times we're afraid that, oh, well, but if I'm, if I am my the real me, then what if people don't like me? What if I'm not accepted? What if the thing is the people that you're here to serve, who they need you to be is who you already are. And so it takes courage sometimes to simply be who we are and to show up authentically as who we are for the people that we serve. And again, I know that sounds simple, but it's not easy, but it's so, so powerful. Rather than showing up to your next meeting today or whatever you're about to go into with who you think you should be, how different would it look for you to show up authentically as who you are? I want to challenge you with that today. Be who you are and own your difference because who this world and who your world needs you to be is exactly who you are. Uh, you need to pick up that microphone and drop it again, Rachel Jenks. Bam! <laughs> There's a fire. I love it. Thank you so much for um, just sharing everything, being vulnerable about everything that you've gone through and using it to help others. Truly, truly appreciate you, your, uh, your heart, and the fact that you were born. So thank you very much for everything. Thank you so much, David. It's my pleasure and my honor. If anything from my journey can help even just one other person, why wouldn't I share? So Thank you for the honor of having me today. Absolutely. And you need to visit Sunny Rochester as, uh, as soon as possible. And we'll grab a coffee <laughs> at Spot Coffee. <laughs> that sounds like a plan. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks again, Rachel. I wish you continued massive success. Thank you so much, David. You too. Thank you, uh, Gonzo family, for listening to yet another episode of the Gonzo Experience every Wednesday morning, a brand new episode. We're on all the main uh, podcast apps, Spotify, Apple, et cetera. Check us out, subscribe, all that good stuff. Love you guys. Have a great day. Make sure to stay awesome.